Hey everybody, welcome back to the cabin. Promised I would do a quick garden tour of this garden. But as you can see, this one is a disaster, much like I uh, anticipated this year with this being pretty much brand new. Did a little bit of planting last year, but, or did I? Yeah, I did. But I cleared a lot more of this this year. And then uh, wood chipped a whole bunch of branches and just spread that everywhere. So I decided that I was gonna really focus on soil um, soil health this year so adding some organic material did a whole bunch of biochar and spread that into where the beds are and I had to be judicious with it because I didn't have so much that I could just spread it everywhere so wherever I knew I was putting paths I tried not to improve those areas um, so yeah wood chips and biochar and all the sort of the garden beds and I decided to leave this path up here the cabins right there you come down through with the four-wheeler is what I was thinking to bring in like little trailer full trailers full of compost and whatever else I might want back here so I left the path and then you go straight out the gate over there I've been milling right there by that gate so that I can use the sawdust to put into here but I think I'm going to move that mill again up here closer to the cabin and then set up a whole shed and work area barn stuff like that I mentioned that in another video but yeah back back on the other side of the kitchen so this path is wider than I probably need I might just slowly reduce that in width um, on this side I planted some small trees uh, fruit trees I've got some apples and uh, apricot um, pear just random stuff like that with not really high expectations I didn't pay much for them they're just little roots uh, bare rootstock that came in the mail so what I did um, mainly along this side is put a whole bunch of perennials things that a lot of them are edible but a lot of it's just for improving the soil health and impro improving the vegetative health here such as you know flowering plants to bring in more pollinators and to bring in uh, parasitic wasps and uh, other like predatory type insects to prey on the pests uh, the ferns want to take over this obviously is <laughs> very acidic dry soil and uh, the ferns and the moss are the predominant species of plant here so I'm having I'm gonna have to mow that stuff down take all the ferns down let the Sun get at at the uh, herbs at the perennials and then uh, work on it a little bit more next year I do have um, like hostas so hostas actually are edible so I'm trying to propagate as many of those like taking divisions off the hostas at the other garden and uh, buying cheap ones when they're on sale and just putting them in random places. There's one coming up here and they do, they need moisture typically and less sun but this one's doing well now, now that we're, you know, summer and the heat of summer is winding down. But anyway, it's cool for a quick walk, really quick. Yeah, aronia, Viking aronia, looks like that died. I'm hoping that the roots some of the plants that didn't sprout up or didn't survive they're going to uh, I hope the roots survived and that they're going to come back up next year spring when there's a lot more moisture and cool weather uh, we'll see overly confident that it's going to happen potatoes definitely need to come out of the ground I think I'll do that tomorrow. Well, I don't want to do it really in this hottest part of the day. It's a nice big potato for these conditions. Oh, holy. Really good ones. That's off of one, from one potato plant. One, two, three. Well, no point counting them. Some of them are small, but the size of them. A couple of pounds at least there. But this is what I grew it in, right? The sort of a little bit of compost on sand essentially and then just covered in straw and wood chips so this is breaking down nicely a lot of moisture in there haven't had rain for a few days so that's pretty good for moisture retention so some of these potatoes are going to get left in the ground they're going to sprout again next year for sure but 
just wanted to show you the how the soil conditions are already improving by having all this biomass breaking down. So lots of carbon. Just keep throwing the uh, some vegetation back in here while it's green to add some nitrogen and have it just compost in place for the most part. I do have the compost bin and you can see a few potatoes that ended up in there are taken over. They sprouted and they're taken over, which is fine. Here's some more asparagus. You saw a huge patch at the other garden, but this is uh, this is doing fine. That's two years old too. So again, I'll harvest some next year if it, it, it does well. This is a mound that I planted into thinking, well, knowing that's very carbon rich, but not much um, in the way of soil. This actually started off pretty good. This is a hardy kiwi, I believe. Uh, yeah, a hardy kiwi. See, the growing tip died. It was doing quite well until we got some drought conditions and the insects kind of got at it. But the other problem is it's right... Well, I was going to use this dead tree right here as a trellis, so which I'll still do. That tree right there, though, is a live spruce tree, and it's actually... It's uh, taking shading the plant from a lot of the rainfall so it's actually not good for location that way but I want to try it anyway got a blueberry right here same thing it's kind of in the rain shadow of this spruce tree and it it uh, suffered big time this year it's so poor these conditions that even like comfrey that I planted this year this spring is doing horribly and in the other garden, it's going absolutely crazy. So really likes the, what I've done with the garden and the soil in that forest, a hardwood forest, much preferring those conditions over this um, pine forest. Look at that. This actually had, had transplanted this, Debbie's Gold Apricot. It was doing really well, full green leaves everywhere. And something came in, bugs, not, uh, not rabbits or deer. And ate all the leaves off and now it's pretty much dead same thing getting too much uh, rain deflection from the trees above how you know dry that is strawberries uh, took really well though more grapes what kind is this a valiant grape I expect those are going to do pretty well next year. They should put on a lot of growth. I'm trying to make this sort of like a little bit more um, naturalized, this whole garden around the greenhouse. Uh, because I ended up making the other one a little bit more formal and organized by having all the uh, garden beds and everything in a neat row, in neat rows, I uh, prefer this type personally. <laughs> My wife and daughters, I think, prefer the, well, I know they prefer the more uh, cultured garden. So that's well organized for them. It's uh, elevated with gar uh, raised garden beds so that they can, they can, uh, you know, manage the gardens and harvest them more comfortably. But I'm doing this forest garden and it's about the same size, about 100 by, at least 100 by 100. And then I've got stuff randomly throughout the field too. But I'm going to, I uh, wanted this to be a path. And then along the fence I had stuff growing. Again, comfrey right there, comfrey there that did not do very well. Got uh, gooseberry, another valiant grape with actual grapes on it. Mind you, they're rock hard, not ripe. And whew, really tart. They're not going to produce. I wouldn't expect them to anyway. That um, plant will grow up and grow along the fence. People ask about electric fence to keep the wildlife out. So this is mainly moose in this area and uh, bear. I haven't had any bear. The bear last year walking right around the cabin sort of down by the when I had the mill further down the trail. But I haven't seen any bear sign here anymore close to the cabin. I think well, now that we're here so often and uh, Callie's here um, bears tend to stay away I think 
even the moose, well, no, the moose are coming back still. They're still in the garden, or the edges of the garden. Anyway, uh, moose are their main uh, big game species and pest. The, uh, there is deer, there's a fair number of deer here. They travel through, they go over to the oak forest and, um, and the beach and stuff like that, but they don't hang out much right here. This is not their ideal feeding kind of terrain or uh, um, ecosystem because it's all, like I said, coniferous. Not, even the beavers have moved out. This was a beaver meadow, uh, which used to be a pond created by uh, beavers damming up this creek going through, flooded this, and then they would come in and eat all this, the uh, like maples and alder and and aspen and stuff like that. But once they clean an area out, they move out um, down to a new area. And I see they're starting to work work their way back up the creek making dams. And I wouldn't be surprised if they try to redo this dam this year. Now that there's a few more uh, succulent trees, but it, for that reason the Deer are mostly, they just come through here. They don't spend too much time trying to get into the garden. So why am I saying that? A lot of people suggested that I put a solar, um, how do you call it, electric fence, which I've, I've owned a couple in the past that I used for the cattle, but the uh, problem with them, you can't have it touch vegetation that shorts it out or grounds it. So I would have to put them on offsets off of this. But what I'm using this entire fence for is trellis, for, uh, is for trellising for, well, grapes, hardy kiwi, shisandra, uh, even beans like annuals and stuff, tomatoes and things like that. So the whole fence will be covered at some point. And then on the outside I've planted prickly rose, wild rose, and uh, sea berry. And that will create sort of a thick hedge around the outside, thorny hedge that will uh, deter most of the animals. Now I'm getting some hairs coming in here and doing some damage. They wiped me out of squashes this year, which is why you're not going to see much. You see a couple of plants that have tried again, but they got eaten back by by rabbits um, bearing hairs and uh, set them back. So I'm not getting any food out of it, out of the squash and pumpkin plants this year and melon. Now this is all <laughs> through the weeds. That's all potatoes different variety French fingerling I think for the most part so I will harvest those shortly as well service berry killed mainly by drought I would say it's not killed it's not it's not dead but it's definitely not thriving smoky Saskatoon berry you'll just eat the flowers Even my rhubarb died right back to the ground. And I don't know if that's just drought conditions. That might be the acidity down here in the higher water table. Um, Egyptian walking onions are doing okay, but this blackberry has just moved right in. I can't believe in much the amount of growth in one season as that comes back from the field and starts taking over these clearings. That's nature. It just does not want to vacuum fills every void and the more um, vigorous the species is the more adapted it is at, for doing that specifically so it's out competing a lot of my other stuff here even the elders not thriving I wouldn't say about two of them here not doing awesome that's the two full growing seasons they've had now. The only thing that's really doing well that's native, and I also planted some cultivars, is the uh, blueberries. Well, blueberries and uh, hazel. Hazelnut. Those bushes I put in are doing pretty well. This one there. One here. That's the second year. They're not going absolutely crazy, but they're doing okay. Got to obviously raspberries and, um, taking over as well. Raspberries and blackberries. Uh, they're mostly, well, I think all of these ones will be native, so I'll probably be, I probably will encourage them, but encourage them to stay on that side of the fence, again, for sort of a wildlife break. More Egyptian walking onions, and more sun chokes, Jerusalem artichokes, same thing, you get little pockets of 
better soil, I probably had a you know shovel full of, or two of compost right there where that one did better. So I'm not going to harvest these ones this year. I'll let them propagate. So they'll, I'll let them spread. So they'll uh, just they're creating more roots underground and or tubers, and that will uh, keep spreading. So I'll let that go at least one more year, but before I harvest. I'm going to just continue to develop this as a hugel mound. Right now, the snakes really like the configuration I've got going on. All the stumps and random wood and everything's creating a lot of pockets underneath. And uh, wildlife is living in there. It's mainly snakes, probably a chipmunk as well. This is was sort of an attempt. I did put some soil here. But again, mostly lambs quarters amaranth i don't know if there's anything still living in here that i planted for vegetables yeah country's doing horribly but like i said you know i'm really just trying to Build up some biomass and some soil fertility and soil uh, microbial activity. So this is going to be good for that. Better than what was here before I took the part of the forest down to make this clearing. It's very uh, just uh, pine and what? Oh, there's a potato. Yeah, it was mostly pine and spruce here. It's a couple of cedars. So there's some. Yeah, I gotta get these potatoes harvested too, because the mulch is dying or like compressing and exposing some of the potatoes. So that's really wet still. So. It's not under trees, but exposed to the sky so that the rain can fall on it and it's beautiful compost. So this is the potatoes that I just grew in hay mostly, right? This entire area all around the greenhouse. It's all just a little bit of soil down first, just in pockets right where the potato is. Potato goes on the soil, which is sitting on sand and other mostly inorganic stuff. And then all the straw and uh, wood chips on top of it so that the potatoes can form in the wood chips. So, or in this, um, in the hay, so that did pretty good. Yeah, so under all this hay, potatoes. So I would call the potato crop a success, even here in these horrible conditions. First year, really, and uh, a lot of effort put in it, put into preparing this area with just vegetation and uh, biochar and um, just mulch and. Everything I can do to add carbon and nitrogen, and I planted a whole bunch of nitrogen fixing plants like uh, like the uh, sea buckthorn, and I've got pretty well everywhere. They're not doing awesome either, but they're doing something, and they will do something over over time. So a lot of blueberries along here, some that I planted, but tons of natural stuff that started growing once I took the trees down and let the sun hit them. Another valiant grape, or no, that's a Manitoba native grape. That's starting to climb. So next year this thing will be partially covered for sure. The year after that, probably be fully covered. Tried some sweet potatoes in the ground, but they just keep getting eaten by insects. The bugs are loving that I've given them this new food to eat. More succulent than what, what used to be here. So that anything that gets up and starts doing well, they just eat it right back. Look, there's a sweet potato with like five leaves on it. I had beans planted in here, I had corn, look at this, oh, some corn. It's a cur apple. And an oak has self-seeded itself. I never have 
bunch of perennials in here. I see raspberries are trying to take over. Got some uh, buckwheat, some seeds that I like, plants that I let go to seed that reseeded themselves this year. Sweet potatoes are liking this dry, or not the dry, but the heat now. But they got eaten back a couple of times too. I doubt I'll get anything out of them. Plus it's still drying after. Well, I guess I can do that now. Irrigate them. Another cur apple. But they did the best of all the apples. Once I saw that I wasn't going to have the time to work on this garden or to stay on top of the garden like I did the other one. And, uh, you know, of course, building the cabin has been the main focus on top of getting the gardens established. Once I realized that, I did that. I just focused all my attention there and let stuff grow here. Didn't even bother weeding and only did watering a few times. So I'm paying the price for that, obviously. But I can't do everything. And it is the reason I keep creating redundancy. One garden fails, another does better. Uh, one type of vegetable does, you know, decent in one spot, fails in the other, then I'm then I'm covered. So this, uh, it's another, what is this apple tree? A hislop apple. That one's from last year. It survived and got one there that survived. One there that survived. So a few apples survived. Pear looks like it got eaten right back almost to the ground, but it'll prop, but not quite to the uh, rootstock. So hopefully that comes back next year. Service berry, apricot. We'll see. But again, I'm in the rain shadow of this pine tree so it's not ideal but I like the sun orientation coming in here and I have to get those solar panels set up so I'm actually moving that up here where it's not uh, shading the garden I'm going to use the frame of that for uh, sort of a fenced in area to protect something like corn or something that I know is going to be really tempting for wildlife so I, I'll take that roof off and uh, I have these adjustable um, but some adjustable racking for the solar panels, so kind of where you're st standing right now. So it's going to change this garden layout a little bit up here, but these are fine. All these trees along here are out of the way and on the north side of the garden, where they're not going to shade anything if they ever grow at all. <laughs> some lovage that's doing horribly. Uh, wild bergamot. Barely hold on. Asparagus, chewing, surviving. Caught me at the end of the season, in transition here at the greenhouse. These pepper plants are done. We harvested. They, they were doing awesome. I showed you that they got so tall, and as I feared, a lot of that energy went into leaf and stock production. They did flower a lot, and actually started setting fruit. And then they just, I think, just ended up depleting the soil here. I couldn't keep up even with the liquid fertilizer. So the plants, well, and then what happened, as soon as they got stressed, we have an, had an aphid infestation. And literally everything in here just got covered in, in aphids. Even the, even the sweet potato stuff that I haven't seen get attacked before, like the marigolds, for example. So the sweet potatoes, the leaves would suffer. And then... Uh, sort of die off and then a new flush. So I think it'll still get sweet potatoes. It's definitely hot enough. <laughs> get some more water into the ground. I'm watering like every two or three days for the most part out of the tank. And then I'm pumping water into the tank to refill it. Um, so these are coming out. It's going to help me cut all these up down, pull all this stuff out, clean this all up, try to get all the disease stuff out of here, all the bugs, all the marigold stuff. Harvest all the onions, let the sweet potatoes go, probably right till, uh, I don't know, mid-October, I would say, after it gets, we get some frost outside that we don't get uh, cold, like low freezing temperatures inside. So I'll leave those there until then. I'll pull the, the onions uh, short, like I said. Replant this. I'm thinking we might do another kimchi garden here. So I have a whole bunch of cabbage seeds that I started a couple weeks ago. 
that are pretty decent size are good for transplanting. But I did that here in the dike on radish now that it's getting cooler and it's hot this week. Um, get uh, cooler weather, weather so that they start growing but they're just bolted. Problem, so what, my biggest failure this year in here was not getting the drip irrigation set back up and um, it did go away, went away for, with Emily for three days and then there's two days before I went camping with her. So there was five or six days that I did not water these plants and then um, let the fertilize them. So that actually set them right back. When I got back, everything was suffering. And that's when the bugs sort of took over. So next year, I'll make sure I get that drip irrigation or this winter, get the drip irrigation set back up again. And uh, what else? The, oh, major crop, major mistake. Well, and because I'm new to the greenhouse gardening, and it caused a lot of these issues that I didn't have the experience or the, the uh, knowledge to fix, like the aphid and, and sort of disease infestation. Basically, it was caused by too much heat. So normally in greenhouses, in uh, warm climates, we get really hot in summer, despite the fact that we're in Canada and get cold winters. We do get really hot summers. You need to either put the shade cloth up. I kept saying I was going to put it up and I didn't. Shade cloth to protect um, the plants from too much direct sunlight and also to reflect some of that heat back out. So I did not do that and I also talked about maybe liming the whole thing. Just do a whitewash on it, make it opaque, more opaque, and that would have um, kept it a lot cooler in here. So what happens is tomatoes go crazy vegetatively but they don't set fruit in, when it's too hot and it's definitely what happened. Tons of greenery here, I'll show you, and not uh, that much for tomato production. And I did all the proper fertilizing things and vibrated the whole plants. That It's easy, that whole trellis, just you know, tap on it, do the drums on it, and you can see the pollen actually falling and landing on it, other flowers and on themselves, like you know, creating little clouds of pollen around the flowers, but it didn't work. It set fruit, you know. Somewhat, but it didn't, uh, it was just way too hot for it to set much. So, big mistake. And cut corners and you get caught a lot of times. <laughs> Not much to see. Got a pocket full of potatoes, bucket full of tomatoes and uh, peppers, and I'll get a couple more of the potatoes that I saw that were coming up close enough to the surface that I should should uh, harvest the, before they start turning green. It's hot in there, and we have another week at least of hot weather. It's what the fourth uh, of September right now, Labor Day, so uh, we will have probably a month. Uh, often we'll get another month before we get a hard enough frost to do some damage and to really stop everything but getting you know, obviously less uh, sunlight hours and less heat and a lot cooler nights like cool enough that it you know the sweet, sweet potatoes and peppers and and uh, tomatoes especially are not going to like it so that's it uh, learning experience this year and some uh, soil production and some perennial establishment and some potatoes, probably, I don't know, at least 50 pounds, maybe 100 pounds of tomatoes, I would say, I'll, or potatoes I'll get out of this garden. Like, they're everywhere, different sections, so I would say. And then on in the other garden, at least 400 pounds. So between the two gardens, uh, more than a million calories, I think I figured. <laughs>